Lucy has this fun little story for us. She used to be a waitress at a restaurant in an army town in order to pay for college. This restaurant, as I said, was higher end. It was rare for kids to eat there to begin with. However, on the 14th of every month, there is a no children night. You have to show your ID to prove you're over 18. These nights are also a bit fancier than usual. There's a dress code, coat check, five course menus, more expensive ingredients, the works. You also need a reservation and pay in advance to have dinner there on no children's night. These nights are so popular that reservations are made at least a month in advance. As you can probably guess, the patrons love it. Well, most of them, anyway. Lucy normally works summers, but when it was the holidays, she'd work there for some extra cash. She was back in town around Valentine's Day, February 14th, her junior year of college, when the owner, John, called and asked her if she was willing to work tonight as they were short-staffed. He even promised her a free meal of her choice. Lucy agreed, knowing she was going to expect a good night and tips alone. Valentine's Day is the most popular no-children night for pretty obvious reasons. Lucy saw more than one woman wearing a fur coat and wearing expensive jewelry. There were even a few officers in dress uniforms. The night was swinging, and then things went to hell in a handbasket. Lucy was carrying a tray of food to a table when all of a sudden, her body slammed by someone. She lost her balance and fell, sending food and plates everywhere. Fortunately, she was more surprised than anything else. There, running around the restaurant like it was on fire, were three kids, ranging in ages from 10 to 2. They're darting under tables, pushing other patrons, screaming, shouting, laughing, just being obnoxious. John rushes over to Lucy. Are you okay? He asked, helping her to her feet. Yeah, I'm fine, Lucy said. Thanks. At this point, a couple of patrons and the other servers are catching the little hooligans. Another server arrives with a dustpan and broom and takes control of the mess. John rounds up the kids, drags them back to the front, and Lucy sees that jerk entitled and his wife, Karen, are there. What? Are your children? Doing here? John asked, his voice full of barely contained rage. The sitter canceled last minute. Jerk entitled said, It's no children's night. I would have given you a refund had you told me. John shouted. Your brat's knocked over a waitress. It's a wonder she wasn't hurt. Don't you dare call my children that, Karen said, wagging a bejeweled finger at John. We pay good money to keep your lights on. You will seat all five of us. And don't expect a tip. No, John said. You're going to take your children home and your family are not coming back. Ever. Don't expect a refund either. Your money will be used to pay for the food and plates your brats ruined. The entitled family left and Lucy assumed that was the end of that. But the night was not over. In the back of the restaurant, by the restrooms, there's a door that leads to the back parking lot. It's left unlocked during business hours and is equipped with an ear-splitting alarm as it's a fire exit. Unfortunately, it was just a regular door not one that can only be accessed by the inside. Sometime later, Lucy is introducing herself to some patrons when there's a loud, ear-splitting siren. Lights above the fire alarms flash. Everyone leaves thinking the kitchen is on fire or something. Because the alarm is connected to the fire department, they arrive with lights and sirens blaring. They arrive and check the building and there's no signs of fire anywhere. The fire department disengaged the alarm and everyone returns to dinner. Lucy assumes it's a faulty alarm. Someone accidentally opened the fire door and doesn't think more about it until after the night is over. She's enjoying a dish that she prepared for her when John slumps in the chair across from her, looking defeated. What's wrong? She asked. He proceeds to tell her. After the firefights confirmed that there was no fire, John like Lucy, assumed the alarm was either faulty or someone accidentally opened the fire door. 
He checked the indoor security camera aimed at the door, only to see it be open from the outside. Suspicious, he checked the outdoor camera. Clear as day. There's the ten-year-old entitled outside, pulling the door open before running off. As it's now a crime, John sends the footage to the police, and they pay a visit to the entitled family. At first, they tried to deny anything. But when the officer said that John was intending to press charges, the 10-year-old revealed Jerk and Karen had paid him $100 each to open the door and set off the alarm. Because of his age, the 10-year-old wasn't charged. However, Child Protective Services paid the family a lovely visit and the entitled family settled out of court before John could sue the pants off of them. They had to pay for a brand new fire door, one that couldn't open on the outside, as well as a brand new alarm system. And John made sure to pick the best grade, i.e. most expensive, on the market. From then on, the hostess would wait outside the restaurant to make sure that no children could get in. I'm 20. Eight years old and live in a town with an inflation crisis. I moved back in with my parents since we have a good relationship. I buy all the groceries and pay the electric bill. My little sister, 16 however, was not happy. She was saying that I should be a man and move out again. A few weeks ago, she started continuously calling me a freeloader and parasitic leech. My parents are anti-tech. They are not part of a cult. They just avoid tech and prefer to live a simple life. The only modern tech they use is a laundry machine, a car, a flip phone, and a TV. Our parents don't, however, take away our gadgets if we paid for it ourselves. When I turned 18 and looked for my first job, I had to handwrite a re-A rim since I didn't have a computer or a printer. It's hard to get a job while still in school because of the poor job market in our town. My little sister was lucky I bought her a smartphone with data plans since she was a young child, yet she was continuously calling me all these names. Eventually, my little sister's constant name calling got on my nerves and I came up with an idea. As the smartphone is under an active installment plan, I simply possess the smartphone. Now she's having the same childhood I had. Oh, and she stopped with the name calling. Update. It had been a while since I took back my smartphone, which I had been lending to my little sister because she kept calling me a parasitic leash for having to move back home due to the rising cost of living. She has had no access to the internet since because our parents are pretty anti-tech and because she has no job. I believe that consequences should be fair, impartial, and reasonable. Reasonable being the key word here. With that said... I decided to give back the smartphone to my little sister as she stopped with the constant name calling, was being a bit friendly, and because I felt bad for her as she was sleeping in bed all day from boredom. Life is very short, and I don't want to hold grudges with anyone, especially my own sister. So I gently knocked on her door with the smartphone in hand. I, little sister, I greeted her through the closed door. What? what which? Uh, my sister yelled. I replied, well, I was going to give you back the smartphone, but it seems like you want to be left alone, so I'll leave you be. Enjoy the day, little sis. She then came out begging for the phone back. I told her that my friend really needed a smartphone, so I was thinking of giving it to him. She sighed and went back in her room. She's sleeping now. I think I'll let her buy her own phone this time. Hopefully, she will mature in the coming years. She was a sweet child a couple of years ago, and I, I hope that you'll be a sweet person in a couple more. Final, final update on Christmas morning. After my last standoff with my little sister, where a smartphone had become a pawn in our game of household politics, I noticed her demeanor had shifted. She was less combative, perhaps a sign of an epiphany. However, I had one final act in mind. For Christmas, I bought my sister a new woolen beanie but I also dug up another old smartphone from my drawer, a phone with a shattered screen and a very poor battery life. I wrapped them up in a parcel and left it underneath the Christmas tree. Her initial excitement quickly fizzled as she seen the phone's condition. Later that afternoon, she confronted me, not with anger, but with a calm respect. She said she was grateful for the smartphone despite its flaws and that she loved the beanie. 
In light of all this, I ordered her a new battery for the smartphone. Old smartphones buy replaceable batteries for the win. Unfortunately for her, though, she'll have to deal with the cracked screen until she saves up enough money for a new phone. Luckily for her, though, she got a job at her friend's pizza joint and can save up. Disclaimer. I understand that my initial actions would have hinged on theft if the phone were paid off. I apologize for any offense caused to the Amish community. Emulating these actions with your loved ones may result in estrangement. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Married nearly 30 years, I found life goes smoother when the wife is happy. Tammy likes my dog stories, especially the ones where Ginger voices her concerns over her maltreatment and my failure to recognize her royal leadership of our house. Merry Christmas to my loving wife. Here's Ginger's rant in her own words. Dad is at it again. His total lack of respect shown to me burns me up. This week demonstrated a total lack of regard towards me and my ever alertness to the dangers surrounding my home. The other day, he would not let me out because the neighbor's dog was wearing fighting clothes. Only I knew this meant he was preparing for war against my subjects. I allowed to live with me and I considered kicking him out of my family. The whole family left me home alone last week for most of the day. Dad comes home without mom. How could you leave mom without my protection? Where did you take her? My duly noted anxiety of mom not coming home with him is met with a nonchalant. I was only gone a half hour, and she went Christmas shopping with sister as he put away the groceries. My dad is still breaking my cookies in half for the last PP of the day, even though millions of my adoring fans request him not to do so. My friends, it gets worse than that. The other day, he held his hand like it held a treat to entice me to follow him. I quietly walk behind him and sit patiently while he hooks the leash, and it totally shocks me when he opens his hand. It's void of the treats. There is no cookie at all in the empty hand of this devilish conover. After this last stunt, I was determined to kick him out of the family at this latest show of rudeness, but then he scratched me on my head. Mom and sister have a loving, fun rub, but a dad scratch dives deep into my skull. It tickles my brain and sends shivers down my back. My eyes roll up to the top of my head to see the deep massage enter in my soul and decide to keep him for another week. I can't kick him out because he is the only one to give deep scalp scratches to soothe my heart. My husband and I were recently in the big city for a visit with friends and family, but mostly for a work function for me. I'm working from home and we were having a work party I wanted to attend. While we were there, my husband requested we visit a few of the other locations in his chain of stores, as he is always curious how other managers do things differently to bring back to his own store. We went into one downtown and it was bumping. He chatted a little bit with the staff, but was mostly preoccupied looking at their selection of wares to see if there were any cool items they carried at their location that he didn't at his lower volume store. While browsing, he noticed a woman trying to grab an item from one of the higher shelves and offered to get it down for her. Once in his hand, he noticed it had a customization on it and pointed it out to the customer and mentioned it would cost a little bit more. Customer did not want the customization and so started flipping through the shelf to find one without. After handing it to her, she proceeded to start asking him about other items, which was when I walked over, gave him a smack, and playfully said, You are so silly, you don't even work here. The customer was so embarrassed and apologized, assuming he worked there because he was dressed so similarly to the other staff. No dress code, but it's a sports store, so staff typically wear jerseys, and he happened to be wearing one that day and because he so quickly and cheerfully helped her. My husband did also apologize, saying I do sort of work here. I work for the company, just that the store in, in her hometown, and since all the guys here seem busy, I thought I could at the very least be a nice person and help grab this for you since I'm taller. In the end, we all had a good laugh, and my husband keeps insisting he didn't mean to go into retail mode while we ourselves were shopping. It's simply because he loves his job so much.